Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. In the previous video, I talked, I sort of talked, summarized the, the um, I went over the table of contents of this uh, particular uh, document. The AMAP Assessment 2015, Methane as an Arctic Climate Forcer. Methane is a huge wild card in the climate system. Large emissions of methane or bursts or ebullitions um, from the Arctic, which is rapidly warming, for example, can basically change climate almost instantaneously. So I'm going to talk, look at the risks of this happening. And, but in order to do this, I need to kind of examine the details, the nitty gritty about methane. So I apologize. Uh, for the technical nature of the of, of this video, the last one, and the the next uh, few subsequent ones uh, when I'm talking about methane. Um, but um, so this document, it'd be nice to see this document updated. The AMAP is the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. Okay, it's a program by the Arctic Council to look at changes in the Arctic. And there's a there's there's an Arctic methane group within this that has done this document about 40 expert uh, scientists experts to look at you know what's going on in the Arctic in terms of methane um, and this was a document that was produced in Norway um, 2015 based on meetings and so on there so like I say it would be nice to see an update but we'll go on what we have so basically. I went through some of the details, and um, so the uh, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. Okay, that's a map. It works under the Arctic Council, um, and they're doing integrated assessment reports on the status and trends of the in, in the Arctic of ecosystems, different changes, look at emerging problems, causes, risks to the Arctic ecosystems. Uh, but it's much further than the Arctic. What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, right? It's not like Las Vegas. Okay, the Arctic changes affect the global circulation because they change the heat balance of where, where the heat and cold is on the planet. So you get ocean circulation changes, you get uh, atmospheric circulation changes, and we're seeing all the extreme weather events now because of the wavier and slower jet streams. Okay, so this was done between 2012 and 2014. Over 40 experts did it. Lead authors in different uh, chapters, etc. It's all based on peer-reviewed data mostly, but there's some stuff. There's no critical probability statements that are based on non-peer-reviewed materials. Okay, so let's get into the nitty-gritty here. Okay, so the um so a couple of previous reports there's arctic climate impact assessment which is an amap report in 2005 there's a swipa snow water ice and permafrost in the arctic 2011 and the, these documents are are updated and hopefully there is a methane update soon so the um okay so basically Carbon dioxide dominates radiative forcing. It accounts for 80 to 90% of total anthropogenic forcing. Um, okay, um, currently, and that's expected into the future, unless, you know, depending on how much methane comes in. Now, it's the main persistent long lived greenhouse gas. Okay, um, and, you know, the, the CO2 molecule is fairly stable, so it depends on. The, uh, the sources and the sinks of it. I mean, the sources are increasing for, with human emissions and the sinks, you know, the main sinks, the oceans, the uh, plant life, etc. cetera. Um, those things are all changing. So some of, a lot of these sinks for CO2 are being suppressed. Um, and now with methane, um, the atmospheric lifetime is about a decade. Okay, so it, it's an opportunity to reduce radiative forcing in the near term. If we reduced the methane levels in the atmosphere, then we would see immediate results in terms of uh, reduction in warming because of this short lifetime um, of, of, of methane. Okay, so there's, a, there's groups that are looking at 
both methane and black carbon to re reduce global and Arctic warming in, in the near term. Okay, so the Arctic Council was focusing in this case on methane and there's also, these are short-lived climate forcers. Um, okay, and uh, so methane and black carbon. Um, can, can, we, can, we can deal with, if we can reduce those and we can have big effects in the short term. Okay, so I like to focus on, on um, basically um, images, on, on graphs. So I'll try to explain them. Like I say, please go through this report. I'm just uh, sort of guiding you along, t telling you some of the key parts of this report. So here we have the, um, th this is the contribution of, these are individual greenhouse gases. And this is how much radiative forcing, how much warming they cause basically. This is watts per meter squared. These are the, this is present day, okay, well 2010. And then these are the different um, intergovernmental panel on climate change scenarios, representative concentration pathways scenarios. So this would be 2.6 watts per square meter forcing in 2100, 4.5 watts per square meter, in 2100 and so on. So these are the increasing scenarios. Right now we're at least here, we're following this path or even beyond this path. So what you can see is, is that CO2 dominates the forcing and um, it's projected to ever increase under these different scenarios. Methane is next in line and then nitrous oxide uh, N2O is next in line. This is mostly from fertilizers and, uh, you know, fixation of nitrogen goes into the ground. So different fertilizers, different agricultural processes. Then this is ozone here projected to increase. Other greenhouse gases here. Now, these are all on the plus side. We have aerosols on the, on the downside. So aerosols, they block some of the incoming sunlight and therefore they cause this uh, negative radiative forcing. And this is land use changes. So if we stop digging up, um, for, if we stop destroying forests and planting cropland, then there'll be more carbon uh, captured. Um, so, so basically we're changing the albedo and we're reducing the sink. So this is, so land use, if we start doing better with land use, we can have a slight negative change here. This is uh, the same sort of graph on a percentage contribution to the, to the total. So what you can see is this line here is 80%. So methane is 80 to about 95%, or, or sorry, CO2 is 80 to about 90, about 80 to 90% roughly. Okay, methane is somewhere in the region 10 to 20%. Okay, and then nitrous oxide, pretty standard, about 10% or so. Ozone is here. Okay, so basically, um, this is, ba basically, this is, uh, you know, it, of course, if there's huge amounts of methane coming up from clathrates or some other, some other um, episodic release of methane from a warming Arctic, then these numbers will be quite different. Methane will be a much larger component. It'll cause warming very, very quickly. Okay, so some of the questions here are, uh, you know, what are the benefit in terms of reducing Arctic warming of methane emissions mitigation by Arctic nations? This is focusing on the nations surrounding the Arctic. And, uh, you know, what, how do you compare the anthropogenic source emissions to potential changes in methane emissions from natural sources, okay? You know, as we change, as the climate changes, as we get a much greater, faster warming Arctic, which is happening, you know, if emissions start skyrocketing from the Arctic, how will they compare to anthropogenic? You know, in the worst case, these become so large that they overwhelm anthropogenic emissions and they rocket us up to a much warmer world. Okay, now let's look at the warming in the Arctic. So this is a combined land and sea surface temperature anomalies. So this is um, 1950 to 2012 relative to 1961 to 1990. Now there's a lot of overlap in these two. This is like 60 years, this is 30 years of data. This is a climatolog climatological mean. 
and these are anomalies from 1950 to 2012, which is unusual because this date even starts here. So you, you're, there's a lot of overlap. I mean, these should really be offset. You know, if this is if this is 1961 to 90, this should be 1990 to present day or something. Or you know, you know what I'm saying? There shouldn't be overlap. Um, but anyway, it's three data sets: Hadley, um, Goddard, and this is a NOAA data set. Merge land ocean surface temperature data set. So you can see um, you can see the data going up here. This is north of 60 degrees. So this is for areas north of 60 degrees, and you can see the rise here, the spread. So we're about you know we're about basically from one degree one to two degrees is the temperature anomaly. So the north of 60, we're warming warming much faster. And the warming is, 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 seems to be accelerating. Um, and this is due to this Arctic amplification effect. Now, let's have a look at the, if we look at the spatial nature of the data, this is a polar plot. We're looking down on the North Pole. Okay, this is the Hadley, the, Jet, the, the Goddard, and the NOAA data set. Now notice that there's very sparse data in the Arctic for these data sets. The GIS is a much better one, so we'll look at it here. So you can see the, this is the um, warming 1950 to 2012. So, so this is warming, this is the change from 1950 to 2012 over the region north of 60. So that'll be the 60 degree uh, latitude line. Um, and so we can, we break the GIST data down into the summer and the winter, and what you can see is most of the warming is over the winter. There's some over the summer, but the vast majority is winter temperatures in the Arctic. And this is, the Arctic's becoming a much darker place, so it absorbs a lot more solar radiation and is heating up. There's also, because of the broken and wavy jet streams, there's a lot of heat transport up into the Arctic in, via the oceans and the atmosphere. A lot of moisture transport, which is also bringing up latent heat. Um, th these are the scenarios, the RCP 2.6. Um, this is for the period 2081 to 2100 relative to 1986 to 2005. So this is the RCP 2.6 scenario, which assumes there's going to be some carbon removal um, through, they talk about bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, but that doesn't seem to be feasible, but it's, it's sort of an assumption which is the IPCC uses. So it shows you the winter warming expected and the summer warming expected under this scenario. Now this is the scenario where we're, that we're on or we're even worse than this. This is the winter, um, and look at the temperatures here. 11, 12, to nine, this is nine to 11, 11 to 13 is a purple degrees Celsius. Okay, projected temperature change, huge warming over the entire Arctic. Okay, uh, it excludes Greenland, there's still a lot of uh, ice and snow on there. Um, and this is the summer. Okay, so in the winter, the warming is all mostly over the Arctic Ocean and the surrounding regions with less over the land as you go out. And in the summer, it, the warming is all over the land really and the ice, you know, there will there be any ice left? I, I doubt it. Um, you know, but the, there's much more warming over the land and less over the ocean, which kind of moderates the the rise in temperature. Um, this is the the zero degree isotherm uh, near surface air temperature isotherm isotherm for the historical ninety six to two thousand and five period um, and the future. Okay, so here, here's what we go. Here's the historical zero degree temperature. This is the annual air temperature average, if you like, is zero degrees. Um, the black line here is the historical under the low emission scenario or scenario with carbon dioxide removal is the blue. So it's shifting up towards the Arctic and the, and the, the path that we're on, we're even worse than this, is the red. Okay, so the Arc there's less and less cold air in, in the Arctic. Okay, so, so basically, um, this is, so these are some of the questions that are asked in each of the chapters. You know, how is methane changing in the Arctic? 